special senses, sensory endings are specialized receptors at the terminals of dendrites that perceive stimuli that are transmitted to the central nervous system for processing. This chapter discusses these specialized receptors that are components of the general or special somatic and visceral afferent pathways. Three different classes of receptors are identified based on the stimulus received, one extra receptors are located on the body surface and receive stimuli such as temperature, pressure, touch, and pain, general somatic afferent, light that permits vision and sound waves that permit the sense of hearing, special somatic afferent, and taste and smell, special visceral afferent, described in chapters 16 and 15. Two proprioceptors are located in tendons, in joint capsules, and in the muscle spindles of skeletal muscle and receive stimuli concerning the alertness of the body position in space. Interoceptors are located within the organs of the body and transmit information about these organs and are part of the general visceral afferent modality. Four specialized peripheral receptors dendritic specializations located in tendons, skin, muscles, fascia, and joint capsules respond to specific stimuli and are categorized as mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, and nociceptors, however, when a particular stimulus reaches a specific intensity, it can stimulate any receptor, Fig 22.1. Five mechanoreceptors, become deformed by the stimulus or by the surrounding tissue and respond to stretch, vibrations, touch, and pressure. They may be either non-encapsulated or encapsulated. There are two types of non-encapsulated mechanoreceptors, Aperitrachial nerve ending CFIG22. ID have neither a myelin sheath nor Schwann cells and enter the epidermis of the face and the cornea of the eye, providing a great deal of sensitivity to touch and pressure to those regions. Additional peritrachial nerve endings are associated with hair follicles and respond to hair movement. Some of the stimuli are interpreted as being tickled, as pain, or even as hot temperature Merkel's discs, CFIG22.1 A are mechanoreceptors discussed in Chapter 14. The encapsulated mechanoreceptors, consist of nerve fibers within a connective tissue capsule. Meissner's corpus cles, abundant in the dermal ridges of the fingertips, eyelids, lips, tongue, nipples, and skin of the foot and forearm, are specialized for tactile discrimination. Three or four nerve terminals along with their Schwann cells are encapsulated by connective tissue elements. Pacini and corpus cles are composed of a single unmyelinated axon surrounded by a complex of connective tissue sheaths of concentric layers of flattened cells. Pacini and corpus cles, located in the dermis, hypodermis, mesentery, and mesocolon, react to pressure, touch, and vibration. Ruffini's endings, are highly branched nerve endings surrounded by a few layers of modified fibroblasts, located in the dermis of the skin, nail beds, periodontal ligaments, and joint capsules. Ruffini's endings perceive stretching and pressure. Krauss's end bulbs, whose function is unknown, are spherical encapsulated endings in the subepithelial connective tissues of the oral and nasal cavities, peritoneum, papillary dermis joints, conjunctiva, and genital regions. Muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs are encapsulated mechanoreceptors specialized for proprioception. Muscle spindles perceive changes in muscle length and their rate of change, whereas Golgi tendon organs monitor tension and its rate of application to the joint. Thermoreceptors have not been identified, but it is assumed that naked nerve endings within the epidermis respond to heat and cold. Nociceptors are widely branched naked nerve endings in the epidermis that perceive pain. They function in one of three ways, they respond to, mechanical stress or damage extremes in heat or cold chemical compounds including bradykinin serotonin, and histamine. One eye, the eyes are the photosensory organs of the body and are housed in the bony orbits of the skull. The eyeball, bulb, globe, fig 22.2, and its associated structures function to receive light rays through the cornea and other refractory structures to focus the rays on the posterior wall of the bulb where the retina with its photosensitive rods and cones are located. When stimulated with light, a signal is transmitted to the brain for processing into a complex visual image that the individual perceives. The eye develops from three sources. 
The retina and the optic nerve are outgrowths of the forebrain and may be observed at four weeks of development. The lens and some of the accessory structures in the anterior portion of the eyes are developed from surface ectoderm of the head. Associated structures within the eyeball and its tunics, coverings, are developed from adjacent mesenchymal tissues. The three layers are the outermost tunica fibrosa, the middle tunica vasculosa, and the innermost tunica nervosa. The components of the tunica fibrosa are the opaque sclera, white sclera, and transparent cornea. The sclera, the opaque white of the eyeball, is composed of type I collagen fibers intermingled with elastic fibers, forming a strong fibrous coat that resists the pressure placed on it by the vitreous and aqueous humors. On its superior, inferior, medial, and lateral surfaces, it receives insertions of the extrinsic muscles of the eye. The deep aspect of the sclera displays the presence of melanocytes, and the posterior extent of the sclera is pierced by the optic nerve. The anterior transparent portion of the bulb, the cornea, bulges anteriorly, is obscular, and is profusely innervated with sensory nerve fibers. The cornea is composed of five layers, corneal epithelium, a stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium, is the continuation of the conjunctiva. The superficial layers of the epithelium display zonuli occludents, whereas cells of the deeper layer interdigitate with and are attached to each other by desmosomes. Pain fibers pierce the basal aspect of the corneal epithelium and arborize near the surface. The epithelial cells at the periphery of the cornea are mitotically active, and newly formed cells take one week to be desquamated. Water and ions from the underlying stroma penetrate the cornea and enter the conjunctival sac. Bowman's membrane, a fibrous layer, is composed of type I collagen that separates the epithelium from the underlying stroma. The stroma, also transparent, is the thickest layer of the cornea. It is composed of 200 to 250 lamellae of a regular arrangement of type I collagen bundles, where the collagen fibers of each lamella are parallel to each other but not to the lamellae superficial or deep to them. The collagen fibers and associated elastic fibers and fibroblasts are embedded in a chondroitin sulfate-rich and keratin sulfate-rich ground substance. The trabecular meshwork of endothelially lined spaces, known as the limbus, is located at the junction of the sclera and the cornea. These spaces are drained by the canal of Schlem, the conduit that delivers the aqueous humor from the anterior chamber of the eye into a venous plexus. Decimet's membrane, a well-developed, thick basement membrane separating the stroma from the corneal endothelium, becomes thicker and more fibrous with age. The corneal endothelium, a simple squamous epithelium lining the deep aspect of the cornea, manufactures decimet's membrane. Additionally, this endothelium actively transports sodium ions, followed passively by chloride ions and water, from the stroma into the anterior chamber, resulting in the dehydration of the stroma. This state maintains the characteristic transparency of the stroma. Clinical considerations glaucoma, the leading cause of blindness in the world, results from prolonged intraocular pressure secondary to the blocking of aqueous humor from exiting the anterior chamber of the eye. Because aqueous humor is in constant production, blockage of its drainage from the anterior chamber of the eye over time builds pressure throughout the entire eye, first affecting the retina, causing a loss of peripheral vision, which leads ultimately to severe damage to the optic nerve and, if left unattended, blindness. Vascular tunica, tunica vasculosa The components of the tunica vasculosa are the choroid, the ciliary body, and the iris, fig 22.3. The choroid, the highly vascularized pigmented layer of the posterior wall of the eyeball, is loosely attached to the tunica fibrosa. It is composed of loose connective tissue housing abundant fibroblasts, many blood vessels, and numerous melanocytes that impart the characteristic black color to the choroid. The inner regions of the choroid, the choriocapillary layer, is especially rich in capillaries and nourishes the retina, from which it is separated by Brooks membrane, whose elastic fiber core is coated on both sides by collagen fibers. The ciliary body, located at the level of the lens, is a wedge-shaped extension of the choroid that surrounds the inner wall of the eye. 
The most anterior extension of the ciliary body adjoins the sclera at the limbus, whereas its most posterior extent abuts the vitreous body. The central, middle, portion juts toward the lens, and projecting from it are finger-like projections, the ciliary processes. The inner surface of the ciliary body and ciliary processes are lined with the pars ciliaris of the retina, a non-light sensitive layer of the retina, composed of two strata, a non-pigmented layer facing the lumen of the bulb and an inner melanin containing pigmented layer. Zonal fibers, composed of fibrillin, radiate out from the ciliary processes of the anterior portion of the ciliary body to insert into the lens capsule forming the suspensory ligaments of the lens. The inner non-pigmented layer of the pars ciliaris transports a plasma filtrate, the aqueous humor, which provides oxygen and nutrients to the lens and cornea, into the posterior chamber of the eye. The aqueous humor then flows through the papillary aperture into the anterior chamber of the eye and eventually exits the eye to enter the canal of Schlem at the limbus to be drained into the venous system. Three bundles of smooth muscles, known as the ciliary muscle, are located within the ciliary body. Because of its position, contractions of one of these muscles assist in opening the canal of Schlem. The remaining two muscles by contracting release tension on the suspensory ligaments of the lens resulting in the lens becoming more convex and thicker permitting the lens to focus on subjects that are close, a process known as accommodation. Relaxation of the ciliary muscles places tension on the lens resulting in its becoming flatter, most acute focusing is on distant objects. The choroid portion of the tunica vasculosa continues anteriorly as the iris, which lies between the anterior and posterior chambers of the eye and covers the entire lens except at the pupil. Its anterior surface possesses two rings, one the papillary zone and the ciliary zone. The anterior surface is irregular with furrows at contraction sites. Its posterior surface is smooth and covered by the same two-layered epithelium covering the ciliary body. The posterior surface facing the lens is deeply pigmented, permitting light to pass only at the pupil. The iris has two intrinsic muscles, the dilator pupillae muscle, which arises from the margin of the iris and radiates toward the pupil and is innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. Contraction of this muscle dilates the pupil in low light levels. The sphincter pupillae muscle, which forms a concentric ring around the pupil and is innervated by the parasympathetic nervous system via the oculomotor nerve, CN3. Contractions constrict the pupil in bright light. The color of the iris depends on the number of melanocytes in the epithelium. Dark eyes result from abundant melanocytes, whereas light blue eyes result from a low number of melanocytes being present. The lens, the lens, a transparent flexible biconvex disc, is composed of several layers of flattened cells and their secretory products, see Fig 22.3. The lens has three parts, the lens capsule represents a transparent basal lamina containing type 4 collagen and glycoprotein. The capsule envelopes the entire lens, being thickest anteriorly. The subcapsular epithelium lies immediately deep to the capsule and is located only anteriorly and laterally. It is composed of a single layer of cuboidal cells that communicate by gap junctions. Cell apices are directed to and interdigitate with the lens fibers. The lens fibers, approximately 200 or more elongated cells, arise from the subscapular epithelium and become highly specialized by losing their nuclei and organelles and becoming long, 7 to 10 gym, hexagonal cells, a process continuing throughout life. These cells become filled with lens proteins called crystal lens that increases their refractory index. Clinical considerations Presbyopia is an age-related condition in which the eye exhibits a progressively diminished ability to focus on near objects. The exact cause is unknown, however, there is evidence that the lens loses its elasticity with age, and this may be coupled with the loss of the contractile strength of the ciliary muscles. Although there is no cure, most individuals can be fitted with prescription eyeglasses that accommodate for the loss of near vision. Cataract is a clouding that develops in the lens of the eye, varying in degree from slight to complete opacity, obstructing the passage of light. Cataracts typically progress slowly to cause vision loss and potentially can cause blindness if untreated. The condition usually affects both eyes, 
but almost always one eye is affected earlier than the other. Cataracts develop from various causes, including long-term exposure to ultraviolet light, exposure to radiation, advanced age, and secondary effects of diseases such as diabetes and hypertension. Cataracts may also be produced by eye injury or physical trauma. Cataracts do not respond to medications, but the affected lens can be removed and replaced with a corrective, artificial lens. Vitreous body, the transparent semi-gelatinous structure filling the posterior concavity behind the lens is known as the vitreous body. It is composed of 99% water containing a small amount of electrolytes, some collagen fibers, and hyaluronic acid. The vitreous body adheres to the retina principally at the aura serrata, the anterior border of the light-sensitive retina. Small cells, called hyalocytes, believed to synthesize collagen and hyaluronic acid, are located at the periphery of the vitreous body. A small channel, the hyaloid canal, located in the midline of the vitreous body, extends from the posterior aspect of the lens to the optic disc, it houses the hyaloid artery in the fetus, but in the adult it is filled with fluid. The retina, neural tunic the innermost tunic of the eye, the retina, fig 22.4, is the neural portion that contains the rods and cones, specialized photoreceptor cells. The retina develops from neural tissue of the optic vesicle originating from the diencephalon of the brain. Later in development, the optic vesicle caves in to form the optic cup. The optic cup consists of two layers and is connected to the brain by the optic stalk. The outer layer of the optic cup becomes the pigment layer of the retina, the inner layer of the optic cup differentiates into the neuronal layer of the retina, retina proper, and the optic stalk becomes the optic nerve. CN2. The pigmented layer of the retina covers the interior surface of the orb, including the ciliary body and the posterior wall of the iris, however, the retina proper ends at the aura serrata. The optic disc on the posterior wall represents the exit site of the optic nerve, and because it is without rods and cones, it is considered the blind spot on the retina. About 2.5 mm lateral to the blind spot is a yellow pigmented zone known as the macula lutea, which possesses a depression in its center called the fovea centralis, where only cones are located. The cones are so tightly packed within the fovea that other layers of the retina are crowded aside. Visual acuity is greatest in the fovea centralis. As distance is increased from the fovea, fewer and fewer cones are present, whereas rods become prevalent. The region of the retina that functions in photoreception is composed of 10 layers that face the inner surface of the choroid. Clinical considerations eye floaters that appear in one's vision, especially in older individuals, and seemingly move about are really shadows of small pieces of debris in the vitreous body that are cast on the retina. As the eye moves from side to side or up and down, these floaters also shift in position within the vitreous body, making the shadows move and appear to float. Eye floaters are associated with retinopathy of diabetes, retinal tears, retinal detachment, and nearsightedness. They occur more commonly in individuals who have had injury to the eyes or cataract surgery. Most eye floaters decrease in size and intensity with time because they may dissolve. The brain eventually disregards them, and the patient ceases to experience them. Detached retina, may be caused by sudden blows around the eye such as from a tennis ball, or jolts from falls on the head. Most often it is from the vitreous body drying and pulling away from the retina, causing a retinal tear as it pulls away from the pigmented layer. The vitreous body may leak fluid behind the retina and detach it further. Individuals with a detached retina need to see an ophthalmologist immediately because early diagnosis and repair provide the best outcome for vision. Delay may permit the detachment to expand to include the entire retina. If left untreated, blindness becomes complete in the affected eye. Current procedures for treating a detached retina include laser surgery and cryotherapy. The layers of the retina, the 10 layers of the retina, from the innermost pigment epithelium to the outermost inner limiting membrane, are very precisely arranged, Fig 22.5. The pigment epithelium is composed of cuboidal to columnar cells, derived from the outer layer of the optic cup, and is attached to Brooks membrane. 
nuclei of the pigment cells are basally located, where the cells invaginate with Brooks membrane, mitochondria are numerous, suggesting active transport. Microvilli extending from the free surface of these cells interdigitate with the tips of the rods and cones. The apical aspects of these cells are filled with granules of melanin, ensuring greater visual acuity. Also, the apical cytoplasm includes residual bodies containing phagocytose tips shed by the rods. Pigmented epithelium functions to prevent light reflections by absorbing the light after it has activated the rods and cone. Phagocyte spent tips of the rods and cones. Esterify vitamin A. Two discrete types of photoreceptor cells are present in the layer of rods and cones, Fig.22.6, see Fig.22.5, of the retina. Rods number about 100 to 120 million, and cones number about 6 million. The apical portions of these highly specialized and polarized cells, called the outer segments, interdigitate with the apical regions of the cells of the pigmented layer. The basal aspects of rods and cones form synapses with the cells of the bipolar layer of the retina. Rods are specialized to perceive objects in dim light, whereas cones are specialized to perceive objects in bright light and to differentiate colors. The photosensitivity of rods, see Fig 22.6, is so acute that they can produce a signal from a single photon of light, yet they cannot generate signals in bright light, and they cannot sense color. Rods are elongated cells, 50 gym long x 3 km in diameter, that are aligned parallel to each other situated perpendicular to the retina. These cells are divided into an outer segment, an inner segment, a nuclear region, and a synaptic region. The rod-shaped light-sensitive end, outer segment, is composed of G00 to 1000 flat, stacked membranous discs, each representing an invagination of the plasma lemma, detached from the cell surface. The membranes contain the light-sensitive pigment called rhodopsin, visual purple. The speed of response to light is slower in rods than in cones, and rods are able to sum the reception collectively. Discs gradually migrate to the apical end of the outer segment and are shed and phagocytosed by pigmented epithelial cells. The inner segment is separated from the outer segment by a constriction, the connecting stalk. A modified cilium arises from the basal body located at the apical part of the inner segment and passes through the connecting stalk into the outer segment. Mitochondria that supply energy for the visual process are packed around the interface of the inner and outer segments. Proteins produced in the inner segment migrate to be integrated into the discs in the outer segment. The following occur in photoreception light is absorbed by rhodopsin, opsin bound to cis retinal, in the rod. Light absorption converts retinal to all trans retinal, which dissociates from opsin. Bleaching produces activated opsin facilitating binding of guanosine triphosphate to the O subunit of transducin a trimeric C protein catalyzing the breakdown of 3,5-cyclic guanosine monophosphate, CCMP. Decreasing cytosolic CCMP concentration results in closure of Na channels in the plasma membrane of the rod. Hyperpolarization of the rod results in inhibition of neurotransmitter release into the synapse with bipolar cells. In the next dark phase, the level of CCMP is regenerated, the Na asterisk channels are reopened, and Na asterisk flow resumes. Remaining all aurons retinal diffuses and is carried to the retinal pigment epithelium via retinal binding proteins. The Alrin 5 retinal is recycled to its 11 cis retinal form. Finally cis retinal is returned to the rod and is bound again to opsin, forming rhodopsin. Na channels in the plasma lemmy are maintained open when rods are not activated by light. During the dark phase, sodium ions are pumped out of the inner segment into the outer segment, triggering release of neurotransmitter substance into the synapse with bipolar cells. The signal is generated uniquely by light-induced hyperpolarization that is transmitted through the cell layers to the ganglion cells, where the signal generates an action potential along the axons on their way to the brain. Layers of the retina, cont. Cones, Elongated cells approximately 60 gym long x 1.5 gym in diameter, Fig 22.7, 
function in a similar fashion to rods except that they perform much better in bright light than in dim light, and they contain the photopigment iodopsin, of which there are three different varieties. Each variety of iodopsin has different opsin moieties, and each possesses a maximum sensitivity to one of three colors of the spectrum, red, green, and blue. The morphology of cones is similar to that of rods except in the following, the outer segment is cone-shaped. The discs are attached to the plasma lemma. Protein produced in the inner segment is inserted in all of the discs. Cones are sensitive to color. Recycling of the photopigment does not require pigment epithelial cells the external, outer, limiting membrane is not a membrane, instead it is the region of zonuli adherence formed between molar cells, see later, and photoreceptor cells the outer nuclear layer is a region occupied by the nuclei of the rods and cones. The outer plexiform layer consists of synapses the nuclei of the rods and cones the outer plexiform layer consists of synapses between axons of photoreceptor cells and dendrites of bipolar and horizontal cells. Two types of synapses exist, flat synapses and invaginated synapses. In the latter, a dendrite of a bipolar cell and a dendrite from each of two horizontal cells form a triad. Synaptic ribbons are present within invaginated synapses that capture and assist in the distribution of neurotransmitter substances. The inner nuclear layer houses the nuclear regions of four cell types, each bipolar neuron may receive input from dozens of rods that permit the summation of signals, which permits enhancement of low-light intensity information. Each cone provides signals to several bipolar neurons, however, augmenting visual information. Axons of bipolar cells synapse on ganglion cell dendrites. Horizontal cells monitor and modulate the synaptic relationship between the photoreceptor cells and bipolar cells dendrites of amacrine cells maintain close contact with synapses between ganglion cells and bipolar cells and transmit their information to interplexiform cells, which influence the activities of horizontal and bipolar cells. Molar cells extend between the vitreous body and the inner segment of rods and cones where they form zonuli adherence with photoreceptor cells at the external limiting membrane. These cells function as supporting cells. The inner plexiform layer is a complex region where axons and dendrites of bipolar, ganglion and amacrine cells intermingle and synapse with each other, forming flat and invaginated synapses. Invaginated synapses consist of a bipolar cell axon and two dendrites of an amacrine cell and a ganglion cell or one dendrite from each of the two different cells, making adiad cell bodies of large multipolar ganglion cells are located in the ganglion cell layer. Hyperpolarization of the rods and cones activates these cells to generate an action potential that is propagated along their axons to the visual areas of the brain. The optic nerve fiber layer is the region of the retina where unmyelinated axons of ganglion cells combine to form nerve fibers. As these axons pierce the sclera, they become myelinated. The inner limiting membrane is the innermost layer of the retina and consists of the basal lamina of the molar cells. Clinical considerations There are two basic types of macular degeneration, wet and dry. Approximately 10% to 15% of cases of macular degeneration are the wet type that first manifested as the dry type. In the wet type of macular degeneration, abnormal blood vessels grow deep to the retina and macula, which may bleed or leak fluid that causes the macula to bulge, resulting in distorting or destroying central vision rapidly and severely. Different types of laser therapy have been used for treatment with only partial success at slowing the degenerative process. Also, scars from laser treatments may affect the macula, causing additional vision loss. More recently, a protein in the eye, called vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, was discovered. This encourages the development of blood vessels. Drugs are being developed to inhibit VEGF by trapping it or preventing it from binding with elements that would stimulate growth. Presently, Three types of VEGF inhibitors are given for treatment by intraocular injections over an extended period. Accessory structure of the eye, junctiva, eyelids, and lacrimal apparatus. The conjunctiva is the transparent mucous membrane, consisting of a stratified columnar epithelium with goblet cells that overlease a loose connective tissue. It lines the internal aspect of the eyelids as the palpebral conjunctiva, 
and reflects over the sclera of the anterior surface of the eyeball as the bulbar conjunctiva. As the bulbar conjunctiva reaches the corneal scleral junction, it no longer has goblet cells and becomes the stratified squamous epithelium of the cornea. The eyelids are folds of thin skin that seal over the anterior surface of the eye. The palpebral margins contain eyelashes that are arranged in rows of three or four, one eyelashes are without erector pili muscles. Two glands of mal modified sweat glands, open into the follicles of the eyelashes. Three mibumian glands, modified sebaceous glands, are within the tarsal plates for the tarsal plates are thickened connective tissue sheaths that support each lid, and mibumian glands form an oily secretion that mixes with and delays the evaporation of tears smaller modified sebaceous glands, the glands of zase, are associated with the eyelashes, and their secretions are emptied into the eyelash follicles. The lacrimal apparatus consists of the lacrimal glands, lacrimal canaliculi, lacrimal sac, and nasolacrimal duct. The lacrimal gland is a serous, compound tubuloalveolar gland whose secretory acini are surrounded by myoepithelial cells. The gland is located outside the conjunctival sac, however, the secreted lacrimal fluid, tears, is emptied into the conjunctival sac via 6 to 12 secretory ducts. Tears, composed mostly of water containing lysozyme, an antibacterial agent, pass through secretory ducts into the conjunctival sac. As the upper eyelid blinks, the tears are wiped medially to enter the lacrimal punctum, a small aperture near the medial margins of the upper and lower eyelids. Each punctum leads to the lacrimal canaliculi that join into a common channel leading to the lacrimal sac, the superior dilated portion of the nasolacrimal duct that opens into the nasal cavity beneath the inferior meatus at the floor of the nasal cavity. Here, vestibulocochlear apparatus the ear serves as the organ of hearing and balance and is divided into three parts, external ear, middle ear, tympanic cavity, and inner ear, fig 22.8. The external ear is composed of the auricle, pinna, external auditory meatus, and tympanic membrane, see fig 22.8. Irregularly shaped plates of elastic cartilage constitute the framework of the auricle, which is continuous with the cartilage of the external auditory meatus. The pinna is covered by tightly adhering thin skin. The external auditory meatus is covered with thin skin containing hair follicles, sebaceous glands, and ceruminous glands, modified sweat glands, that produce cerumen, earwax. The hair and the cerumen assist in thwarting objects from entering into the deep aspects of the meatus. The tympanic membrane, covering the deepest aspect of the external auditory meatus, represents the closing plate between the first pharyngeal groove and HRST pharyngeal pouch. Its external surface is composed of epithelium derived from ectoderm, whereas the internal surface is covered by epithelium derived from endoderm. A few scattered mesodermal connective tissue elements are located between these two surfaces. Sound waves are transmitted through the external auditory meatus, causing the tympanic membrane to vibrate. These vibrations are transmitted to the bony ossicles of the middle ear. Clinical considerations Conjunctivitis is an inflammation of the conjunctiva that may result from many sources, including bacterial and viral infections, then the condition is known also as pink eye, and from injury to the eye, but in most cases from exposure to allergens. Symptoms include redness of the sclera, irritation, itching, and watering of the eye with occasional puffiness of the eyelids. Cases of viral and bacterial conjunctivitis are contagious and require medical treatment, whereas conjunctivitis from other causes may resolve in a few days or one to two weeks. When the condition persists, the patient should be evaluated by a physician because some forms of conjunctivitis may cause blindness if untreated. The connection to the pharynx is opened during swallowing, yawning, and blowing the nose, permitting an equalization of the air pressure on the two sides of the tympanic membrane. The pressure differential can be felt during rapid descent when landing in an aircraft. Swallowing normally eases this pressure on the ear by opening the auditory tube at the pharynx middle ear, the middle ear, tympanic cavity, fig 22.9, is located within the petros portion of the temporal bone and is an air-filled space between the tympanic membrane and the membrane covering the oval window.
it communicates posteriorly with the mastoid air cells and anteriorly with the pharynx via the auditory tube, eustachian tube. The three ossicles occupy this space, which is lined by a simple squamous epithelium, a continuation of the lining of the internal surface of the tympanic membrane. The bony wall of the tympanic cavity is replaced with cartilage as it approaches the auditory tube, and the epithelial lining changes to a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. The lamina propria in this region contains numerous mucous glands that open into the lumen of the tympanic cavity, and, near the opening to the pharynx, goblet cells and lymphoid tissue are present. Along the medial wall of the tympanic cavity are two membrane-covered gaps in the bony wall the oval and round windows that connect the middle ear cavity to the inner ear. The inner surface of the tympanic membrane is connected to the membrane of the oval window by the three bony ossicles the malleus, incus, and stapes. These bony ossicles transmit and amplify the vibrations of the tympanic membrane to the membrane of the oval window. Two small striated muscles the tensor tympani muscle innervate by the trigeminal nerve, CNV, and the stapedius muscle innervate by the facial nerve, CN7, function in modulating the vibrations of the tympanic membrane and the movements of the bony articulations. Inner ear, the inner ear, see Fig 22.9, is composed of the bony labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth that is suspended within it. The bony labyrinth, Fig 22.10, housed within the petros portion of the temporal bone, is lined with endosteum and is separated from the membranous labyrinth by the paralymph-filled perilymphatic space. The central portion of the bony labyrinth is the vestibule, posterior to which is the vestibular mechanism, consisting of the three semicircular canals, superior, posterior, and lateral, which arise from and return to the vestibule. One end of each semicircular canal is enlarged and is known as the ampulla. Suspended within the canals are the semicircular ducts, all part of the membranous labyrinth. The lateral wall of the vestibule contains the membrane-covered oval and round windows. Also arising from the vestibule are specialized regions of the membranous labyrinth, the utricle, and the saccule. Anterior to the vestibule is the cochlea, a hollowed-out spiral space in the petros temporal bone that turns on itself two and one-half times around a central column of bone known as the modiolus and its bony shelf, the osseous spiral lamina, providing a mode of entry for blood vessels and the spiral ganglion of the cochlear division of the vestibulocochlear nerve. The membranous labyrinth, see Fig 2210, composed of ectodermally derived epithelium, is suspended from the bony labyrinth by strands of connective tissue. The membranous labyrinth gives rise to the saccule, utricle, semicircular ducts, and cochlear duct. Endolymph, a viscous fluid, circulates within the membranous labyrinth. The saccule and utricle are connected to each other via a small duct. Also, each possesses small ducts that join to form the endolymphatic duct, whose blind end is known as the endolymphatic sac. Another small duct between the saccule and the cochlear duct is the ductus reuniens. Specialized regions of the saccule, macula of the saccule, and of the utricle, macula of the utricle, are receptors that monitor the orientation of the head in space and its acceleration. Both maculae possess non-neuroepithelial cells and neuroepithelial receptor cells. Inner ear. Non-receptor cells of both maculae are of two types, light cells and dark cells, whose functions are unknown, although it is suggested that the light cells may absorb endolymph, whereas dark cells may control the composition of endolymph. Two types of receptor cells, Fig 22.11, are present in the two maculae types I and two hair cells, neuroepithelial cells. Both types of hair cells possess a single kinocilium and 50 to 100 stereocilia arranged in rows. Supporting cells sit on the basal lamina and are believed to maintain the hair cells or produce endolymph. The vestibular division of the vestibulocochlear nerve serves the hair cells, see Fig 22.11. The stereocilia of the hair cells are embedded in a thick gelatinous mass, the otolithic membrane, whose surface contains otoliths or otoconia, calcium carbonate crystals. The membranous labyrinth continues from the utricle as the three semicircular ducts, Fig 22.12,
housed in their respective semicircular canals. The expanded lateral ends of all three ducts are known as ampullae and contain specialized receptor sites known as Christi ampullaries. Each Christa ampullaris displays a crest containing neuroepithelial hair cells wedged between supporting cells, all sitting on a basal lamina. The hair cells are similar to the hair cells within the utricle and the saccule. A gelatinous mass overlying the Christi ampullaries is the cupula, but it does not contain otoliths. The cochlear duct, scolomedia, arising from the membranous labyrinth of the saccule, is a receptor organ housed within the bony cochlea. It is wedge-shaped and surrounded on two sides by perilymph. Two membranes of the cochlear duct form the wedge. The membrane forming the roof of the cochlear duct is the vestibular membrane, whereas the membrane forming the floor of the cochlear duct is the basilar membrane. These two membranes isolate the cochlear duct from the surrounding perilymph. The perilymph-filled compartment above the vestibular membrane is the scala vestibuli, and the compartment below the basilar membrane is the scala tympani. Communication between these two perilymph-filled compartments occurs at the helicotrema. The vestibular membrane consists of two layers of squamous epithelia separated by a basal lamina. The basilar membrane supports the organ of corti, fig 22.13, and it possesses various types of cells, some of whose functions are unknown, and others such as the interdental cells that secrete the tectorial membrane, a gelatinous mass that overlies the organ of corti. Stereocilia of specialized receptor cells are embedded in the tectorial membrane. Neuroepithelial, hair, cells of the organ of corti transduce impulses for hearing. These are the inner hair cells and outer hair cells. Inner hair cells are arranged as a single row of cells and surrounded by support cells. Inner hair cells are small and contain a centrally placed nucleus, copious mitochondria, rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and small vesicles. Microtubules are located in the basilar area. Stereocilia, 50 to 60 arranged in a V-shape, emanate from the apical surface. Stereocilia cores contain microfilaments, cross-linked with fimbrin. Also, MICR elements of the stereocilia merge with the terminal web. A basal body and a centriole are present in the apical region of the inner hair cells. The basal cell membranes of the inner hair cell synapse with afferent fibers of the cochlear division of the vestibulocochlear nerve. Outer hair cells, located near the outer boundary of the organ of corti, are arranged in rows of three along the length of the organ. The outer hair cells are elongated cylindrical cells whose nuclei are located basally. Their cytoplasm contains rough endoplasmic reticulum and numerous basally located mitochondria. Just internal to the lateral cell membrane is a structure known as a cortical lattice composed of 5 to 7 nanometers filaments that are cross-linked with thinner filaments. It is assumed that this structure functions to support the hair cells and resist their deformation. About 100 stereocilia organized to form the shape of a W emanate for the apical surface of the outer hair cells. Also, because their length varies, they are arranged in gradations according to length. Outer hair cells are without a kinocilium but do possess a basal body. Afferent and efferent fibers of the cochlear division of the vestibulocochlear nerve synapse on the basilar portions of the hair cell. Functions of the ear The dual functions of the ear are to monitor the body's position and movement in three-dimensional space, vestibular function, and the discernment of sound, cochlear function. Vestibular function of the inner ear monitors the changes in the velocity of the linear or circular movement of the head, a function that depends on the vestibular apparatus the utricle, saccule, and semicircular ducts. The endolymph of the ampullae of the utricle and saccule responds to linear movements of the head by causing the otoliths and the otolithic membrane to be displaced. As a consequence of the membrane displacement, the hair cell's stereocilia bend and the hair cell's membrane becomes depolarized. The change in resting membrane potential initiates action potentials that are transmitted to the vestibular division of the vestibulocochlear nerve that conveys the impulses to the brain for processing. 
neuroepithelial hair cells of the Christi ampullaries of the cupula within the semicircular ducts react to circular movements of the head in a similar fashion as those of the utricle and saccule respond to linear movement. The stereocilia of the hair cells in the Christi ampullaries become distorted in response to the movement of the endolymph in the semicircular ducts. Bending of the stereocilia results in the initiation of action potentials in the hair cells that are transduced to the vestibular division of the vestibulocochlear nerve for transmission to the brain for processing. Linear and circular movements of the head require contraction of the skeletal muscles that are responsible for maintenance of balance. For that to occur, the brain must interpret the information it received from the hair cells of the vestibular apparatus and prepare an almost instantaneous response to prevent the individual from losing balance and falling down. Cochlear function, see Fig 22.13, is the responsibility of all three regions of the ear, external, middle, and inner ears. Sound waves received by the ear and passed through the external auditory meatus reach the tympanic membrane, setting it into motion. This motion becomes translated into mechanical energy that sets the malleus and the two other bony ossicles of the middle cavity into motion. The vibrations of the tympanic membrane are amplified by about 20 times as the energy is passed to the footplate of the stapes, where it impinges on the membrane of the oval window. Two small skeletal muscles in the middle ear cavity modulate movements of the malleus and the stapes. Movements of the membrane of the oval window create pressure waves in the perilymph within the scala vestibuli, through the helicotrema and into the scala tympani, causing wave-like movements of the basilar membrane. This movement creates a shearing motion on the stereocilia of the hair cells embedded in the tectorial membrane. As the stereocilia are deflected, the cell becomes depolarized and generates an impulse that is transmitted to afferent nerve fibers of the cochlear division of the vestibulocochlear nerve to the brain for processing. High frequency sounds are detected at the lower end of the organ of Corti, see Fig 22.13, whereas low frequency sounds are detected at the upper end of the organ of Corti, near its apex. Clinical considerations Meniere's disease is an episodic abnormality of the inner ear causing a host of symptoms, including severe dizziness, tinnitus, ringing sound in the ears, fluctuating hearing loss, and the sensation of pressure or pain in the affected ear. The disorder usually affects only one ear and is a common cause of hearing loss. The symptoms are associated with an increase in endolymph volume within a portion of the inner ear, causing the membranous labyrinth to balloon or dilate, a condition known as endolymphatic hydrops. Many experts believe that a rupture of the membranous labyrinth allows the endolymph to mix with perilymph, a condition that can cause the symptoms of Meniere's disease. Other experts are investigating several possible causes of the disease, including environmental factors and diet. Although there is no cure for Meniere's disease, Symptoms can be controlled successfully by reducing the retention of body fluids and dietary changes such as a low-salt or salt-free diet along with the abstaining from caffeine or alcohol. Sensorineural hearing loss, nerve deafness typically occurs in the organ of Corti when the hair cells are damaged or destroyed. Sensorineural hearing loss may have various causes, including heredity, aging, disease, infection, or prolonged exposure to loud noise. The nerve trunk to the brain is rarely damaged. Instead, damage most often occurs in the hair cells in the organ of Corti, which serve to send information, in the form of electrical signals, to the cochlear nerve. When a significant number of hair cells are damaged, an individual experiences severe or profound hearing loss, and hearing aids cannot alleviate the problem. In cases of profound hearing loss, a cochlear implant may be indicated. Conductive deafness results when sound waves are impeded or prevented from being conducted through the outer ear or the middle ear or both and are prevented from being received by the inner ear. Conditions that may lead to conductive deafness include foreign objects, ruptured eardrum, impacted earwax, otitis media, and otosclerosis, where the footplate of the stapes becomes fixed to the oval window. Otitis media, is a common infection that occurs in the middle ear cavity, especially in young children resulting from a respiratory infection that has involved the auditory tube. With otitis media, there is a fluid buildup in the middle ear cavity that restricts movement of the bony ossicles, 
restricting the ability to hear with the affected ear. The usual treatment for this condition is antibiotic therapy.